So here today to talk about prayer, which is a little like giving a talk on the Pacific Ocean. And I've got around 20 to 30 minutes to do it, so I've got that going for me. So what I mean to do is take a little bite and hopefully leave more questions than answers as this is sort of a lifelong topic that just can't be contained in two semesters of a college course, let alone a brief video. So with that, we should just get started. And where else would an endeavor like this begin than with a deep philosopher like Mr. George Carlin. So here's the video. People do it anyway. But what is the point We're of We're lowly of human prayer. beings. I, we I, pray for all kinds of I'm things. Told, I'm told by people who pray, yeah. I, I say to them, suppose God doesn't answer your prayer. And they say, well, then uh, it's his will. I will accept his will. Then what is the point of praying in the first place if, you're going, if he's going to do what he wants to anyway? There's supposedly a divine for plan. Well, how are you so <laughs> arrogant as to ask him to change his plan for some narrow reason, whether it's health or, or wealth? I mean, because I don't, we I, are arrogant. We all think the but, world revolves but, around us. But do us. you think prayer works? I mean, I, I pray to Joe I, I, Pesci. I don't believe in... I pray to Joe Pesci, and I get the same <laughs> results. <laughs> I get the same results I used to get from God when I was nine years old, and I, and I believed in the invisible man in the sky. Yeah. You get about half the things you pray for. It's, an, it's, it's a pr laws of probability. Half the things you pray for, you get. Half of them, you don't. You write off the half you don't. The half you get, you say, oh, isn't he great? And it's just a game. It's a, it's a form of mental illness. No, I, 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 yeah. I, I just thought there is no as God. As insulting as that, that is, there is, there is, is no God. Will he strike me dead right now? Will he? <laughs> he doesn't not. dare. You know what? Pray not. It's dare. It's, he doesn't dare. <laughs> I think it's so much care about our individual I have, a, I have a good point. Yes. You know, when you, when you talk about God in this society, when you profess a belief in God, they just toss the name around. You know, every <laughs> end of every politician's speech, God, yeah. bless, God bless us all, God bless you, God bless America. And, and let me say and God this. bless you and God, God bless, bless your book all. being number one. That's, that's lovely. He, he had very little to do with that. It's all individual Ooh. human. No, please, let me explain something. Um, God... Uh, it's, it's a wonderful idea, it's a nice fantasy, it's a way of keeping people in line, it's a way of controlling people. There is as much proof Everything for the existence of God, or even evidence, forget proof, there's as much evidence for the existence of God as there is for the existence of UFOs and extraterrestrials, and yet, if you mention them for a moment, you're considered outside, beyond the pale, you're a kook, you're marginalized, you're crazy. If you mention, if you don't, if you don't love God, then you're, you're some, there's something wrong George, with you. It's absurd. It, what, there's if it no, makes, what if it makes people feel Feel better. That's a different thing. That is. If you want to exactly. give the universe the name God, that's fine. The universe exists. We are all equal parts of it. But we are don't made of the same stuff. I, I are most, that's good. Are, are I most religions, religions, most religions are based on the idea that somebody in some way through prayer can yes, make you feel better? Yes, but why do you need to make up stories? Yes, why should why it be a does person? the supreme being have to be just because what? life is hard, and you need to make up stories. I don't need to make As long as you realize you're that it's minded you, you need that. I don't understand the arrogance of saying that you are a lot of strong-minded people who people, uh, that, that are very, very they sincere. They appear strong-minded, but if they really believe that there's a man in the sky keeping score, something is wrong but with them. But does it matter if something... As long as you believe in something I mean, that I makes believe, you get through I believe the day. in the vastness of the universe and in infinity. I believe in family and friends. I believe in love. So that's and your those, God. Those, no, it's and not my God. Those, that's are, your those are not God. That's your spiritual God means an old man in the sky. It doesn't mean that to me. Well, I don't, I don't why do you use the word? The why do you need the word God? What does the word God do? Yeah, I don't need the word God. Does he decide actually. things for no, you? No, he doesn't. I don't believe in then a key at all. you don't believe what all these other people believe. You have you have a more sophisticated approach to it, and right. I, I yes. respect that. But I, I think don't we... denigrate anybody else's oh, approach I do. to it. I do, too. Yeah. <laughs> I do, too. Yeah. And I say it all the time. So, pretty confused on the matter of prayer, George Carlin is. Uh, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, we read that God does not change. But any scriptural reference to God relenting or abating his anger or being on some sort of spectrum of emotion, these things are all anthropologic and they're allegorical ways of describing our experience, our human experience, what it feels like when we alienate ourselves from God's love and mercy. It is not to claim that God actually does change. So, Spoiler alert, 
it turns out George was wrong. We don't get what we want when we pray 50% of the time. Sorry. But the good news is we get what God wants. So, the Catechism, paragraph 2010. I'll just read this. Moved by the Holy Spirit and by charity, which is the Catholic word for love, we can merit for ourselves and for others the graces needed for our sanctification, for the increase of grace and charity, and for the attainment of eternal life. Even temporal goods like health and friendship can be merited in accordance with God's wisdom. These graces and material goods are rightly the object of Christian prayer. Prayer is necessary to receive the grace we need for meritorious actions. Prayer is necessary, necessary for our salvation. So, what this all means is that God chooses to include us and our free will into his providential plan of salvation. Again, referencing the Catechism, paragraph 2259. Prayer is, this is my parenthetical attachment, or should be, the raising of the will and mind to God. So, taken in a purely transcendent sense, at the end of the day, our prayer needs to be learning to accept reality. But this doesn't mean being resigned to some situational futility. It means to trust have confidence in, hope in, the reality that God has ordered, is ordering, and will order all the events in our lives towards one thing, and it's the only thing that matters, our salvation. We need look no further than our Blessed Mother in her fiat to the angel Gabriel. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to thy word. And our Lord himself. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. This is standard example that Christ wishes for us to model our prayer life after. And here is the standard boilerplate instruction for human beings on prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The goal. Radical surrender to the will of God. The thing is, this is impossible to do without grace. Through this supernatural assistance, we are enabled to develop a habit of regular prayer. So, trigger warning. It takes effort. We cannot merit the grace by which God saves us. We can and must cooperate with it, utilize it, and bring it to bear in our relationship to God and with each other. The more time we spend in prayer, the more we exchange our will for the will of God. There is this idea that in every other element of life, it takes elbow grease, effort, deliberate intention to get better at what we do, whether it's our professional life, our personal life, our relationships, fitness and health. The idea somehow that we are able just to declare our intention to have a meaningful relationship with Christ just makes no sense. And, and the idea that we can show up once a week for an hour, if it is an hour, and have a meaningful, transcendent, powerful relationship with Christ is insane. It takes effort and intention and deliberate acting to enter into this reality with God. So who says? Who says we can't do anything without grace? Well. The Magisterium of the Church says this. Pope St. Leo I, speaking around the mid-5th century, man does no good thing except that which God, by his grace, enables him to do. The Council of Trent, just reinforcing this point some 1,100 years later, no one shall assert that without the previous inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and his assistance, man can believe, hope, 
love, or repent as he ought in order to obtain the grace of justification, which is integral to the point of why we pray. Now back to George Carlin, changing God's mind. Is that really what we do? So the answer is no, we can't change God's mind or even influence him. God is unchanging, has no emotions, has no spectrum of emotion from sad to happy. We understand and teach that God has predetermined from all eternity to allow our prayers to bring about his purposes. The principal goal of prayer isn't to change God, God's will, but to change ours, to bring our will into accord with the divine will. That's a lot of Catholic speak. Just to say that what the Christian says to God is, thy will be done. But what the superstitious practitioner of some religion says is, my will be done. So that superstitious practice can be an occult practitioner of some sort of bizarre satanic ritual. It can be some pagan ritual or it can be a Christian. A Christian who doesn't have the correct intention behind his or her, his or her prayers. We don't pray to manipulate supernatural forces for our own agenda as that is an occult practice. It's not as if someone can be thinking necessarily about, gosh, what is my intention when I am in my agony asking Christ for deliverance from one thing or another. That's not really foremost on our, on our minds, but it's part of the habit that we need to develop over time to make our intention be the will of God. And that takes time, and that takes the utilization of grace. From eternity past, God has predetermined and chosen to use our prayers as one of the instrumental causes to bring about the unfolding of his will. God makes use of human prayer to accomplish his purposes. This is nothing new. This is woven throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. God uses human agency. It's baked in to the economy of salvation from Abraham to Noah to Moses. God needs none of these people. God needs none of the prophets. Our Lord needed none of the apostles. He didn't need St. Paul. He didn't need the fathers of the early church. He could have created our salvation in any way he wanted to. But this is part of the beauty of our Christian faith that we profess, is that baked into the whole system of salvation that, that has come out of the, the mind of God is that we get to be co-redeemers. We get to be co-creators. This is an authority that God gives us and commands us to use. This is a powerful, beautiful thing that I think Catholics in particular understand and profess. God has efficacious prayer built into the fabric of the universe. However, having said all this, it does not mean that then this falls outside of the scope of his eternal will, and it still doesn't change anything about him. What can this mean then? It's appropriate to ask for things, but with the understanding that whatever happens, happens within the permissive will of God. What does ultimately happen is intended, is intended for our good, even if it doesn't align with our immediate assessment of what our idea of good is. So here's the thing. The more we can purify our prayer and bring it into line with God's will, the holier and happier we'll be, and the more our prayers will be answered in the way we ask. 
Okay, so remember these weights. This whole approach to prayer doesn't happen overnight. It is a gradual renov renovation of our interior life through the power of grace. We change who we are through the participation in the life of grace. And it has to be intentional and deliberate. Let's talk about some prayer pro tips. Very common statement. I'm really lousy at praying. G.K. Chesterton said, if a thing is worth doing, it is worth doing badly. I'm not sure he was thinking about prayer when he said this, but it sure applies. People get the idea that if there isn't some profound emotional experience during their prayer, if they don't have some internal locution or some big thing happen during their prayer time, there's something wrong. And that's just not the case. Commonly heard outside the Adoration Chapel. My mind is racing. I can't get quiet. I'm too distracted by the events and the concerns of the day. This is a very common problem that people talk about when they try to develop a meaningful prayer life. The Catechism describes spiritual dryness as belonging to contemplative prayer when the heart is separated from God with no taste for thoughts, memories, and feelings, especially spiritual ones. So this is not an unusual phenomenon at all. Our minds are creations in the image and likeness of God by God. So it's our nature to have our minds race from time to time. Our nature that God created and works in and through. If your mind races and you can't get it under control, that's okay. God can work with that in times of quiet prayer and will if you just give him a chance. It just takes effort. We have to have a habit of showing up for prayer, sacrificing part of our day, every day, and that takes self-denial, sacrifice, and effort. We know from her writings after her death that Mother Teresa had this intense experience of dryness in her prayer life. She says, I used to pray that God would feed the hungry or do this or that, but now I pray that he will guide me to do whatever I'm supposed to do, what I can do. I used to pray for answers. But now I'm praying for strength. I used to believe that prayer changes things. But now I know that prayer changes us and we change things. If Mother Teresa has this experience, we can certainly work through it. There are only three answers to prayer. Yes, not yet, and here's something better. The measure of our spiritual life is the degree to which we're okay with the last two. The one sincere prayer God will always say yes to. Following the teachings of St. Basil, St. Chrysostom, Clement of Alexandria, St. Augustine, and the other fathers, prayer is necessary to adults not only because of the obligation to do so, but because it is necessary as a means of salvation. That is to say, in the ordinary course of providence, which is God's will, it is impossible that a Christian should be saved without recommending himself to God and asking for the graces necessary to salvation. So imagine if you only had one prayer left. I suspect that day is coming for all of us. What would that prayer be? Thanks for listening, and I hope this is helpful in taking a look at just one angle on prayer. Mm -hmm.